after we've asked that key question, we are trying to target their commitment toward a change goal. So this involves revisiting the task of focusing, right? So we need to agree upon the focus for change. And then I'm going to continue to use evocation. So the evocation, it's still change talk, but it's going to be more evoking the actual actions that she could take to do something different toward that agreed upon goal. So hopefully that shows you how these tasks are not linear and that they really overlap, um, that they complement one another. So I will come back to focusing and evocation. What would you like to do at this point? And at first she says, I don't know. Um, and I decide to go ahead and have that pregnant pause that I'm, I'm not satisfied with that answer. Um, so I'm just going to wait a little bit and see if she can give us something else. So at some point, she begins talking again and talks about how your mom is, um, drives her crazy. Um, you know, all she does is criticize and, you know, nag at her, um, tells her what to do. So at this point, I offer a complex reflection to soften the sustain talk. And I said something like, what you want is for her to change. The mother is willing to attend some um, joint sessions. We, we did that early on, and we had just been focusing on um, Macy and uh, some coping skills as far as her anxiety went at that point. So um, I hadn't scheduled her mom to come in, and the mother had not, um, well, expressed an interest uh, in coming in yet. Um, but that is something that's on the table. However, right now, I need to redirect Macy back to her own um, journey, right? Her own change process. So I try that envisioning strategy again. If your mother agreed to make some changes, what changes would you agree to make to improve your relationship with her? So I'm trying a, you know, instead of the bigger picture one that I said, well, hey, if those barriers were gone, what would that be like? I'm trying to get her to say, well, if she did make some changes, what would you be willing to do? I think just trying to maybe bring it down a little um, to more maybe practical terms. So after some discussion, Macy does choose a goal. She came up with it and says that she's willing to work on not cursing her mother out. So the verbal abuse that she sometimes gives to her mom. So she's agreed to work on that, that that's the goal in this planning task that we're in. So now what is the plan? So what are the steps that she's willing to take in order to help herself not curse her mother out? Again, we want to evoke from Macy uh, her ideas about, well, how could you do that? What would help you to withhold your language, to better watch what you say? When we are trying to evoke these ideas from a client, they may have, you know, clear idea or ideas. This is what I want to do or I plan to do. They may have several ideas. So I could do this or I could do that. So they have ideas, but they're not decided. Or it's possible they don't have any ideas. You know, honestly, I'm just not even sure where to start. So we're going to respond accordingly, right? So if they have some specific ideas, we're going to go with that. In Macy's case, she says, well, I'm just going to try not to do it. 
So that sometimes happens, right? We get a vague response, right? Well, I'm just going to try not to do it. Um, so it's not unusual, and especially with teenagers, to get a vague response like that. Certainly, that's not really a, a clear plan. So I may try to redirect by re-asking the question one more time, um, where I might say, well, how could you do that? I'm going to try to prompt her to think about it a little bit more. Again, this is supposed to be an empowering approach. You know, it's really about bringing out her strengths. So I'm going to try not to be the one to give her the answers. So I ask her that, and she still seemed, um, you know, kind of stumped by it, I guess. I think she wasn't really sure where to go with it. You know, kind of the I don't know answer um, that can happen sometimes. We could ask her to think of a time that she did actually hold her tongue when she was getting into an argument with her mom. Think of a time that you did manage to hold back. How did you do that? And so I would ask that question open-ended like that. I would avoid asking it close-ended like, can you think of a time? I would really try to get her to answer it, to really think about it. Um, that's one of the things I, I love about this approach and really fit for me in terms of my style as a counselor because I don't feel like it's my place to, to give them the answers. Um, that if if they can figure it out, then I've empowered them. I've helped them really experience their own autonomy, right? And that builds their confidence and their ability to change. I'm giving her a direction. So that's what I mean by this approach is directional, that I really want her to think about it. Tell me about a time you did hold your tongue. How did you do that? What was happening? So you could see where the point of that is finding potential solutions, right? That maybe there's something she could think of. And it's much better if she thinks of the answer rather than me giving it to her. And if she thinks of something, she's more likely to, to implement it if it's her idea, but also that it again builds her confidence and her ability to do something different it's more affirming of the client that if she's able to think of it and go, wow, you're right, I've done that before and this is how I did it. So hopefully that's what happens. If that doesn't happen that way and we do need to make some suggestions, we should get her permission first. So just like when I was talking about focusing, that if we need to bring up a possible topic for the agenda of the session, I'm going to ask their permission, right? You know, here's a topic. Do you mind if we talk about it? Now I'm going to say, well, I have some ideas that other clients have tried and found helpful. Do you mind if I share them? Or I could ask, would you like me to share them? Either way, however you want to ask it. So again, it is a close-ended question, but it's a permission question. And it's an important permission question because she has to say yes or no. If you've ever dealt with someone who tends to have that psychological reactance, that they tend to want to go against what they're being told, um, I like to call it being rebellious, um, and I'm one of those people. So if you prepare me for something, I mean, it could be even permission, like, can I give you some feedback on that? Or can I give you some suggestions? You will get farther with me if you ask my permission instead of just kind of rattling off the suggestions. Because then I'm like, okay, I know that now I'm supposed to listen and I'm going to think about what you said. I still may say, no, it's not, I can't, I don't like that idea. Um, but I'm more likely to be more open to those suggestions. And that is something that I try to do with Macy a lot. Um, and as I mentioned earlier about the permission questions is that it does reinforce their autonomy, um, helps them feel in control, 
not really of the session, but of their change journey, that they are in charge of their own change process. 